welcome everybody to um, a new uh, phase in Mock uh, Alliance. We are at Shop Talk in Las Vegas. Excited to be here for our very first LinkedIn Live panel of the week. Um, I'm Shannon Avenia. I'm the community lead here at Mock Alliance, and I'm pleased to host today's session, Picking Your Partners. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to each of our speakers so they can introduce themselves to you. Casey. Hi, good morning. I'm Casey Gannon. I am the VP of Growth at Bold Commerce. Um, Bold Commerce's flagship product is Bold Checkout, and it's designed to help brands and retailers sort of take that first step in their digital transformation as they're shifting to a mock or composable architecture. Great. Hello, everyone. Brian Walker. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at Bloomreach. Bloomreach, we provide commerce optimization and marketing automation solutions, so product discovery, CDP, email and SMS marketing. We're relatively new members to the Mock Alliance, but I feel like I've been a part of this community for a long time. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Looking forward to the discussion. Hi, my name is Irina Jurevich. I'm a VP at EPAM Systems, um, running our CPG and retail vertical. At EPAM, we're helping our customers to stay relevant, solve most technical problem on the market, and uh, Mac is one of those uh, most frequently used go-to-market solutions for us. Absolutely, love to hear that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to kick it off with our first question. Um, can you walk me through some of the key benefits to Mach? Sure. You want to go in order? My first. Yeah. Um, so many of the benefits for where I sit and where Bold sits and what I do on a daily basis ladders up to business acceleration. So we see, I think there are some typical things around, obviously you have flexibility, you don't have vendor lock-in, you can set up um, a pool of resources to pull from as you need to adapt to the market. But what we see is that you're able to uh, build quicker for your business requirements, but you're also able to adapt to the needs of the market really quickly. And so one of the stories we always talk about at Bold is when COVID hit, Staples Canada is one of our clients, and when COVID hit, um, they had already started a BOPIS implementation, but within 72 hours, utilizing not just Bold, but our partners at OrderBot, Contentful, and some others, we were able to spin up curbside in 72 hours. And that feels you know, a couple of years ago, if you talked about that, that feels very impossible. So it's, it all, to me, ladders up to business acceleration, whether you're building for your requirements or you're adapting to the market. Uh, very well said. Uh, I would echo that. I think, you know, one other thing to think about is really agility. Um, and we're entering into yet another phase uh, of evolution on, on commerce experiences and things like conversational commerce now suddenly seem like they are perhaps not too far in the distant future. Now, we don't really know how effective those will be, uh, how quickly the customer will adapt them, but those are the kinds of things that you as a brand and as a retailer probably want to be thinking about when you're laying out your, your tech strategy today. And as you said, if you have vendor lock-in, you're, you're going to be really constrained by what your principal solution provider, software provider, can provide you, and that is a risk, frankly, to your business. So I think it's about agility, it's about flexibility, and it's about adaptability. It's also, in many cases, about efficiency when you think about the you know resources that may be going into supporting a legacy environment um, that you may be running either on the front end or the back end. And you know there's there's opportunities there to gain some efficiencies as well, which of course is very important in, in today's economy. I definitely agree with uh, the flexibility, right? Yesterday's sessions were all about the headwinds of the economy and how retailers need to adapt to cost optimization and a little bit more of a frugal spending. If you have Mac architecture, you are able to scale back somewhat when you need it and scale up when you want it to. Um, it, scalability, definitely, right? We touched on that. Um, but I would also add um, rapid uh, innovation as part mm -hmm. of the um, really, really accelerating um, um, moments for Mac because um, faster, uh, smoother, more engaging customer experience is what retailers need to bring right now to the market to still kind of pull their market share and to be able uh, to really attract newer consumer. If you have this uh, kind of API architecture, you can quickly be, build a proof of concept. You can quickly uh, roll it out to the market, test it out. That gives you a very strong advantage. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah. So how would someone go about evaluating 
mock technologies? How do they begin that process? I think you're probably better suited, but I'll give my two second or my two cents. Um, you start with bold commerce. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, I, I actually think that it's the opposite, is that you have to start with a needs analysis. What requirements do you have for your customer journey, for your business operations? What's unique about your business that your legacy or monolith doesn't serve? And I think you really have to understand that. And then you understand the features that are required to serve that. And then you do a vendor analysis. Um, now, what gets a little tricky, I think, in uh, conversations that I've had is um, whether you're doing a, a full launch to composable or mark, mock architecture or if you take it one step at a time. And, and that's where we specialize right now is working with brands who want to take the first step, see an immediate impact, and then add and layer on additional vendors. Um, I also, this is where SIs and um, our agency partners come in key. They've got accelerators built. They know which technologies work well together, how to stack the technologies to solve for your unique business case. Um, and so that's, for me, that's the way I'd look at it, is what do you need um, specifically, plan, define it, um, then pick your vendors. And ultimately, you need to do it with people you trust, whether that's an internal team you've hired or a, um, an agency or an SI. I really like that idea of trust. Um, as part of this, right? So as much as we want to innovate and to optimize, the way that you do that best is with people mm -hmm. that you can really rely it's upon. A, it, it's a massive undertaking. It's your business that you're transforming. So you've got to have people on your side that uh, that you trust to make those decisions. Yeah, and I especially think about, right, those people that are going from the monolith. <laughs> right. You know, they need that that extra kind of, you know, hand-holding. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I think it's obvious that the principles behind how to go about selecting uh, uh, your, your vendor set um, don't really dramatically change uh, from how you may have gone about it in the past, right? You probably already have many different point solutions and other things that are providing the functional capabilities that you need uh, to run the business. Those don't necessarily change, but I do think as you move into a mock architecture, integration and accelerators become pretty important. Um, integration is not something you're going to want to, you know, spend heavily on. So you want to work with vendors that have demonstrated the ability to integrate effectively. You want to, you know, potentially take advantage of accelerators, which is really about integration fundamentally, making sure that these, you know, this set of solutions. Um, have already been proven to work work together. Um, and I think those are really important. And I think it's also valid to say in any vendor selection process, right? It's fundamentally about the business value that you're going to get, whether it's driving conversion rate, driving average order size, those kind of KPIs, or whether it's what your team needs to operate. But certainly you need to then also evaluate it uh, next to your technology strategy and where you're going long term. And as you said, an incremental approach is probably advisable for many, ban uh, many brands, especially here in North America, where you've got established legacy environments. So thinking about, okay, here's our technology strategy. Here's the kind of principles uh, we're going to use when we make the final decisions about who we're going to work with, but it still needs to be grounded, obviously, in, in the business value and what you're trying to, to, to accomplish. And, and I think, you know, working again with your SIs and agency partners to come up with a plan, and that plan will have some flexibility. That's the whole point of, of mock in many respects, so to avoid vendor lock-in, but have a plan, have a strategy, and that might play out over the course of a year or two or three. Mm -hmm. Well, and the, that idea, right, of, event, of business value can be so personal, right? You have to really tailor it to your needs. Um, you'd mentioned the uh, idea of, you know, focusing on, on those that can help you integrate effectively. Do you have any tips for what that could look like? How do you determine if somebody's able to do that? I actually love to, to hear what Arena has to say. Yeah. You've got a lot of experience with this. Um, <laughs> so to, an to answer that particular question, I would say um, proof of concept. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like honestly, the best way, like the way we do it at EPAM, we suggest a framework which starts, um, as Casey said, from business requirements. Mm -hmm. What's your business case? Are you solving for loyalty? Are you solving for omnichannel? Are you solving for scaling? Uh, second step would be um, kind of technical requirements. Is it uh, a limitation that a company tries to avoid? Is this uh, the newer technology that's out there and you try to explore? 
Um, and vendor selection would be a natural mm -hmm. third step, and not just because I'm a, uh, from a consulting company, but I, um, it's not, it's a massive program, right? It's, it's not mm -hmm. a small undertaking. It's complex technically. I do not see how uh, a brand or retailer should be kind of doing this heavy lifting on their own. There is an mm -hmm. ecosystem of partners who did it multiple times in multiple environments. They know where the bodies are. They, know, <laughs> <laughs> they know how to avoid yeah. those, those traps. And the best way to choose that partner is not just to look at well, PowerPoint decks or you know, yeah. just presentations. Uh, proof of concept. When you have this business case, it's very easy to to find the best partner for it. Yeah, and I think you know we do a lot of POCs um, and and trials, and many of the other mock vendors are doing the same. And I would encourage that as well because then you actually do kick the tires. Mm -hmm. You may actually see it may be hard to necessarily prove out how it will impact the overall KPIs in a POC. I mean, it depends. Yeah. Um, but you'll certainly have a sense for the business user tooling, for example, or the integration challenges, or how easy was that to get up and running and run a portion of your traffic against it, um, and really avoid some nasty surprises. Mm -hmm. And then I think your point as well about uh, utilizing um, partners, right? I think. There's going to be some pitfalls. There will be mistakes. If this is your first time doing this, let's be honest, you'll probably make them. Um, why waste time and money? Um, you know, you, you want to work with vendors and, 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 and services providers who can help guide you through that process. It is complicated in many respects. We shouldn't overstate or understate. Um, as you said, right, there's, there's some complexity here. So working with a partner enables you to, again, potentially take advantage of accelerators and avoid some common pitfalls if it's your first time uh, at the rodeo. And maybe even understand the total cost of ownership, right? Because it's very hard when you're just approaching this topic to understand all the licensing, all the integration costs, like everything that will come into the bottom line. So uh, talking to a partner who can give you some examples and case studies of how it had been done and help you navigate through what's the best way to approach it. And I'm a big proponent of uh, more iterative approach as well, just mm -hmm. starting slower and then rolling out. And then it's, uh, in the end, much easier to convince mm -hmm. your CFO to do it too, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting too, right? We have, uh, you know, I think that, that mindset, right, of wanting to, you know, get it right the first time, which is why people get locked into monoliths and then, the idea of transitioning from that causes some anxiety. As I've said many times in my career, <laughs> uh, as you can see, it's been a bit of a long one. Um, I've been working in e-commerce technology on many different sides of the table. Um, these are programs, they're not projects. Like if you approach it from the standpoint of like, this is a program that we're moving you know, on that will take some time. This is not a project. This is not a project that will launch and then we're done. Um, and if you take a program mindset, it just sort of subtly changes the framework you're operating against. And I think it's a healthier approach just in terms of how you think about it versus like selling your organization, selling your leadership mm -hmm. on this big bang project. And then, well, you're putting a lot of chips on the table. We happen to be in Vegas. So that analogy, <laughs> that analogy well works done. here. Well uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think, you know, but if you take a more of a program mindset, you, you think differently about how you're going to approach it, um, about proving things out, about smaller wins that then build momentum and trust mm -hmm. um, in what you're trying yeah. to accomplish. And a part of it is um, organizational change management. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of adopting the newer uh, way of thinking, the newer ways of working. Mm -hmm. And one of the most frequently seen pitfalls that we are um, solving for is uh, the brands would try and do the transformation and that would come out of the IT organization mm -hmm. and the CIO would be sponsoring and there would be no full buy-in from the business mm -hmm. side, no full buy-in from the marketing side and it's impossible to have a program of this massive scale to be successful if everyone doesn't come along mm -hmm. on that 
you know, yeah. train of a transformation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I would also say, I think in order to take advantage of the true benefits of a mock architecture, if you think about it, this has sort of inspired me now, if you think about it as a program <laughs> instead of a project, um, so you're launching this one feature set or we've this phase one, if you think about it as a program, you're able to um, take advantage of the agility, which is that quick response to the market that right. needs to happen because you're constantly thinking about it. You've set up your organization to think about it. And so I think that's a, a really um, great way to put it is that it's a program and it's not a project and it's not a one and done or three phased approach. This has to become part of the way you think within your organization. I agree. Absolutely. Um, one other thing before we maybe go to our, our last question um, is around the, that, that, right, that, that kind of mindset shift, right, and this idea of long-term planning, um, you know, having this sort of healthy, um, you know, approach to this program change. Are there things that, um, you know, a, an organization that's kind of looking at maybe doing this transition can do to make that, that feel not so overwhelming as they're trying to evaluate partners and decide how they're going to, to do this? I do have a, a bit of a thought. First of all, um, <laughs> of course, uh, the you're probably already working with mock solutions in a way. You may already be down this kind of avenue in a way. Mm -hmm. Maybe don't try to sell it as this big, huge thing inside your organization. That can be scary. Lots of CFOs, <laughs> CEOs, CDOs, et cetera, CMOs are going to feel the scars of very large technology transformation yeah, projects, sure. right? Um, digital transformation, for example, kind of a bad word inside of a lot of corporate environments sure. because, you know, those big projects tend to present a lot of risk and they tend to go over budget and they take longer than they'd planned. Um, and that's not a good thing, especially in today's environment, right? And that could be could have been an old ERP implementation or it could have been something else. It doesn't really matter. Maybe don't sell it as this big, huge thing inside your organization. Talk about it more as a strategy and that this is an incremental evolution. Here's the steps. Now, there may be some bigger steps in there. You know, not every step is small. Some steps might be bigger. Um, but talk about this more as a, again, a strategy and a program and you're moving in this direction. And here are the steps we're going to take to get there. Here are the benefits. Here's the business case, all of those things. But you're already probably kind of in that mock transition. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a mock uh, solution provider. We work with a lot of companies who have integrated us also into uh, a legacy environment. That's true of a lot of the other mock community. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, we absolutely believe that a microservices-based headless strategy is the way forward. So a lot of companies are already kind of in the transition, and maybe you sell it more that way versus like, oh, this big bang, you know, kind of approach, and it seems risky versus lower the perceived risk. Yeah, Casey. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there's um, even just simple language conversations, right, mm -hmm. instead of digital transformation, composable, and the building block theme. Um, I also, I don't know if this completely answers your question, but I, I do want to say, I think when we talk about ecom tech and we talk about legacy and monolith, and um, it's always scary. And it's and even kind of sitting here, I think we've brought that tone a little bit, right? Because it is a big undertaking, and it's a core part of your business. Yeah, um, and with composable, and you the analogy around building blocks and when you start to see some of the imagery with composable I actually think you can make this really fun and I think it brings back sorry I'm in marketing and so this is what I like let's make happen. composable fun um, yeah and <laughs> bring fun back um but I do, I think that what happens when you start to see that this can be quick, that you can plug and play, that you can move blocks around, um, you start to, to have uh, imagination again about what your experience could be at least on the consumer side this is where I get really excited is when we create really fun consumer experiences that um, give uh, consumers a reason to come in your store or go to your website and they have that overused word of customer delight that wow moment right um, <laughs> can't and understate that though. I know it's true and I think though that by introducing this type of architecture and in, in some of the conversations you have, it shouldn't just be about the technology. It, you need to have um, bring some of that passion back for what you were trying to do with your brand um, and when you're reintroducing it in the company, right, and showing the shifts. And it should start to become fun. It should be like 
maybe not as far as a toddler playing with building blocks and moving them around, but that concept mm -hmm. of we're not frustrated and stuck with our tech. We now have the freedom to do what we want to do. Let's have some fun with this yeah. and let's be innovative behind it. Yeah, I like so. that. Gamifying your transition. Sure, I like that. <laughs> Here we yeah, I think uh, demystification of uh, going 100% Mac is uh, a big topic that we're engaging um, into. Um, as I said before, usually the CIO would be a sponsor of such a program, but um, it, it's of course, it's very challenging to come to your head of business and essentially say, and now we're going to disrupt the core of everything that you're doing because we need a transformation. <laughs> Never going to go, right? Yeah. It's like, it's, yeah. it's just not a conversation starter. So uh, the most successful uh, programs that I saw are when CIO adopts this as a North Star. Mm -hmm. right. And let's be honest, it's a few years kind of of endeavor so the north star doesn't mean you have to like put dates on the paper and have like people deliver to it it means you know where you're going and uh i really like how you described adopting the kind of technology solution to the business outcomes mm -hmm. so if you if uh, you're really close to your business leaders you do understand what drives the the revenue, what drives the adoption, uh, then in that North Star plan, and I'm from technology, so I like to break it down into like work decomposition, but <laughs> you just build it up from, this is gonna be bring very quickly fast results. That's gonna make my partner and business very happy. Mm -hmm. And they, doesn't, they don't even need to know that's part of your big transformation. You don't need to use this word. You just basically help technology foster business, accelerate the business instead of just doing the um, transformation for the sake of newer tech stack. I agree that with that. I, I would say, though, I, I do think that if you're a business leader and you're watching this or you're in this discussion inside your organization, you should get educated on what we're talking about. What What's behind these acronyms and terminology? Educate yourself. Don't let it be scary or unknown. Um, and then if you're a developer or you're on the technical side, like take the time to explain why and how this will play out over some time. But I completely agree with like the incremental delivery of value and the quick wins. Cause that then again, builds momentum and trust inside the organization. And you're then with your next step that you're advocating, everyone's gonna be like, great. The last one or two or three or five went really well. Let's, let's yeah. go for it. Is there a term like Mac literacy? Like, you know, mm -hmm. data literacy is a yeah. big thing, right? Yeah. You like you don't do the data platform or data democratization <laughs> without instilling some literacy in the organization. How do you read mm -hmm. the data? How do you use the data? So maybe it should be like Mac literacy. I, I think that's course. on our agenda this year to help with. So yeah, <laughs> I think. <laughs> well, and that's exactly what I was thinking, right? I think that's like sort of the, the next frontier, you know, it's because a lot of these basic elements are things, that's part of why the Mac Alliance exists. Mm -hmm. right. um, but that, that next frontier really is that, that larger education piece, right, and, and supporting initiatives to become mock literate. I love that. I'm going to steal that, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's called inspiration. Love it. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and kind of as, as we're wrapping up, um, the last uh, thing I want to get your, your thoughts around is, um, you know, we've talked about sort of all these ways that that you know, people can ap approach these kinds of transitions and knowing what the benefits are, making it fun. Um, but I'm curious, you know, where you may have ever seen a company that is that is uh, transitioned, right? That they've adopted that that mock mindset and then said, you know what, this really isn't our thing. Let's go back to the monolith. And, right, and I mean, like, I, of course, we know the answer to that, you know, <laughs> but but you know, why do you think that is? You know, why why are they why are they not then going back to the well? I, I would say there there <laughs> will probably be some boardroom conversations that where someone you know has a relationship with a senior member of a of a solution technology provider who may be a monolith um, and you <laughs> will embodied it fully, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I've seen this play out, um, again, in my career in a number of ways. And that's part of the strategy, of course, of these types of, of sweet vendors and so on. I'm not going to name names, but you know, we all kind of know who I'm talking about, uh, including those on my previous CV. Um, <laughs> the, um, 
and it's a part of the strategy, right? You're going to, you're going to try to go in over the top and you're going to try to make a case that actually, you know, everything you need is in this solution and your organization is spending too much money and you know, they're, they're overstepping and all these things. So I think it's going to be some top down pressure at times mm -hmm. and you should inside your organization, if you feel like that's a risk, um, lay the groundwork again, educate the board. You know, educate the CEO and the C-suite. Don't have this be hidden, right? Um, and and explain like why you're doing this in order to again create the opportunity to differentiate and have the business agility, and how the efficiencies actually in many cases play out in favor of a transition to a mock architecture. But it's probably not going to come from your peers inside the organization unless the project's going really poorly, then that's probably on you. Um, <laughs> but, but there will be some top-down pressure. I think in, in certain organizations, especially in this current economic environment, um, you know, that's, that's frankly um, could happen. Um, inside certain types of organizations. I'm not sure if that's what you were asking me, but that's certainly how I think about it. Well, no, that. I mean, I think that that feeds into it as yeah. well. Casey? Yeah. I, I mean, I've never experienced this. I, I do think mock architecture and composable commerce are still new enough in the adoption rate. Um, it, it's not been around enough to see if we've gone through cycles with starting and going back. Um, I think where maybe I've heard about this is more when they've tried the incre incremental approach um, so there wasn't a, a big commitment and investment from the org strategy. structure, the with business operations. Um, it was a sort of a test, and they said, we're not ready yet. And so um, for the organizations that have taken the time to plan, to build, to commit to the digital transformation, um, <laughs> bad word, I know, but it <laughs> is what it is, mm -hmm. once you've made that investment, it's you're not just backtracking it immediately because um, these are big changes. And I also think, like, I've never bought a new car and then returned it for my old one, right? Like it's also someone that I did, that, one. I did that once. Well, I was going to say there's some anomalies, <laughs> so I wouldn't be surprised if there's someone out there who's done that. And here he is. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, but I think for most um, companies, I think they're going to see in most brands that they've reestablished uh, how they operate internally. They've made the investment, and now they're seeing the benefit, the cost efficiency, the agility, the flexibility all of these things that we've been talking about. And so there isn't a need to move back to the monolith unless there is some really downward financial pressure to figure out how to drop those costs immediately. Right. Even then, I'm not sure they'd really be saving anything yeah. at that well, point. Well, and speaking to, to Brian's, you know, car purchasing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I think that right, like that, you know, the, the sort of, the, the catastrophes that would have to happen yeah. in order to uh, engage that buyer's remorse would have to be pretty significant. Uh, actually, I, I, I apologize I for jumping in here, okay. I, I, but I, I, do, I do think it's worth saying that if you're on the development and kind of program side of all of this, um, where you present risk of like potentially, you know, pressure to roll back is if you haven't thought through, again, the organizational changes and the business process changes with any technology implementation, not just mock, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you haven't really thought through, well, how, how are merchants and marketers going to interact with this solution or what have you, you know, you, you go to launch and all of a sudden you realize, oh, we didn't think through the business process changes. We didn't think through that, you know, this is going to have a big impact on just doing day-to-day -day business. Right. Well, then obviously the business is going to be like, hold on a minute. We're not ready, right? And that's just, that's true of any technology implementation, right? It's not just related to mock. But so obviously, don't buy the Maserati when you have to take the kids to their sports. Yeah, it, if you, you know, <laughs> turns out Ferraris are really weird to drive and completely confusing. So you might have thought that was going to be really cool to drive off the lot. And that's not the car I returned, right. by the way. Oh, just okay, to, good. Just, to just be, somebody you know. No, no, no. But I'm just saying, like, you know, um, so be prepared. So yeah. maybe... Make sure, like, again, that's just first principles of any technology implementation, right? Yeah, that's not something that's more new... responsive, more agile, and you're not used to that. Well, yes, and, and there's certain, you know, cases where um, maybe the all-in-one solution worked a certain way, and the organization developed around that, right? right. They, the, the roles, the responsibilities, the workflow, all of those things kind of grew up around whatever environment you're moving off of, right? Now you're implementing a whole new set of things. They work differently. Their integrations, all of these things work differently. If you haven't thought through how you're going to operate in that new environment, 
I mean, you're 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 really putting the the business behind the eight ball. Yeah, I I never seen anyone going back to monolith, but what I did see is this kind of a trap when you're almost off the monolith solution, but you still pay the license, mm. and you're halfway on the new architecture, mm. but you don't have the investment to complete it. That's a good point. And then yeah. you're kind of paying double, and if mm-hmm. it's 2023, 20, you can't afford it, and then you may slow down and say, let's stop, let's wait for a while and figure out you know, what's gonna happen next. And I think here's where partners really be, can be very uh, instrumental in solving that challenge because this is where accelerators come to, mm-hmm. you know, really good um, usage. But also um, going back to like breaking the work into smaller uh, chunks, you know, digestible chunks can really help to avoid mm-hmm. that situation when you invested a lot, but you need twice more to mm-hmm. complete it. And then this is such a trouble and everyone in the yeah. organization is exploding. Mm-hmm. So like proper planning in um, taking into account the economy, what's going mm-hmm. on out there, um, investing smartly. But again, working with partners is very important here because support costs, because licenses cost, because organizational uh, change management, it all is in the end contributing to the bottom line. So kind of working out it from the get-go, from the beginning can help avoid a slowdown. Mm-hmm. And I think slowdown is really a challenge, not the kind of going backwards. That's, I agree and, with you. Yeah. And it's not about perfect planning either, right? It's No, it's an agile world, right? It's exactly. It's more <laughs> of the kind of smaller plan, plan, smaller steps. But I think that there's, you know, there's enough kind of analogies that you can use when you're communicating with senior leadership and so on about, you know, the iPhone moment, for example, and other things. And we are, as I said earlier, kind of on the cusp of another kind of set of transformations of the customer experience um, and how they engage digitally. And I'm talking about things like large language models and generative AI and all these kinds of things that will... Yes, exactly. I was trying not to, but thank you. Um, but but not so much on – that'll have back office implications, but also potentially on the customer experience. Yeah. And if you're not ready to adapt those because you've got an agile services-based approach and headless, then, you know, you're, you're potentially – behind competitors who could out innovate you mm-hmm. um, and and really disrupt your 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 market right and so that's an analogy that you could use right well remember mobile like how many years did it take us to get mobile right um, mm-hmm. because we were on an environment that didn't adapt easily to it mm-hmm. those kinds of things become interesting ways for senior leadership to understand the kind of moment we're in. Mm -hmm. And even though there's economic pressure um, and everyone wants to be very pragmatic right now, which I think is prudent in a lot of cases, um, the reality is, um, you know, these things are moving pretty quickly. And as I said, you could potentially make a case for efficiency, um, which would obviously help the CFO uh, Mm -hmm. see value in your project, right? Um, What other guidance do you have? near the end of our session around this. Any other maybe key things that we haven't touched on that are favorites of yours? Things that you feel strongly about as we're, you know, kind of encouraging people to be so careful in their planning and to, you know, do this to their best advantage. Oh, I feel like we've covered so much of it already. Um, (laughs) I I would maybe just encourage anyone who is um, any, um, any, you know, digital leader who's considering this to look into the Mock Alliance. Um, I think that the Mock Alliance, well, I I think we're a partner for a reason. I think that um, it really is around bringing uh, the best technology to the market, the best partners, the best tech partners and SIs and agencies, um, and it's educational. And so that's really that first step I think that we've been talking about today um, is it's it's about understanding what you really want to do and building a plan around it. And I think the Mock Alliance is a really good step. I think you're obviously watching this you know, today or whenever on demand. And I think that's a, a really good first step is just around the education of what does this really mean? Um, when I first started in sort of the composable headless space, 
uh, I was getting different definitions and different explanations from everyone I spoke to. And I think go Google it today and you're going to see some threads of similarity. But um, it really is about understanding how you're going to put because it's your it's your wildest imagination, right? Like, what do I want to build? I'm going to get those blocks. I'm going to put those blocks together and build that experience, whether it's back office or front end, which means there's a lot of room for error. And so I would say the education and you need to build a, a team of people you trust, whether it's on staff, whether it's partners, whether it's just through Mock Alliance. I think that's probably where I would start if I um, were on the brand side is with people and um, starting to understand what they've done for a digital transformation. Absolutely. Uh, my, you know, my, my input would be to act thoughtfully but urgently um, in a sense. So I think you should, whether or not you're going to begin uh, projects, you know, this year or not, most likely you're going to be implementing a number of different things this year regardless. You want to have uh, a strategy uh, around your 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 technology and what you're going to implement. And again, this we're kind of hiding a little bit behind an acronym when we say mock, but we're really talking about a modern contemporary technology uh, environment and architecture. Um, and this is how software needs to be built. This is how you build for scale and you build for agility moving forward. And as I said earlier you're probably already using mock solutions and a composable strategy in different mm -hmm. parts of your business. So, you know, develop a strategy, develop a plan, right? Think through, obviously, as you go to um, address larger pieces of the customer experience or the operational solutions that you need, you know, apply that to it. And again, I'd say, um, you know, think about the skill sets inside your organization and the partners you're working with to support that kind of transformation. So I'd say act thoughtfully, become better educated, um, try to understand this, set a strategy, and then, and then start to work with, with urgency. Uh, I, I think even in this current economic environment, um, it's important that you continue to, to push this forward uh, and prepare uh, for what comes next. Uh, it's so hard to add something, but um, <laughs> if you're far from being headless and far from being composable and not on the cloud, and I don't know who you are, but <laughs> maybe, uh, I would, I, I want to really refer to yesterday's, the CEO of Chewy was given this um, story about how his business transformed, and I love the uh, approach which I want to recommend. They had seven um, warehouses, all manual, nothing automated. Mm -hmm. They invested heavily in automation and their margins were negative. And it was a very difficult two years of catching up with the margins, but now they have 14 warehouses, all automated, and the margins are through the roof. Mm -hmm. So if someone is at the very, very beginning of the journey, curious but afraid to take the first step, I think first, and important thing is to adopt the mindset you're investing in the future of your business. Mm -hmm. And even if one year or whatever, a little bit more, it's going to be a little harder in terms of margins, a little more uh, difficult to make the numbers work going forward. That's the only thing literally that can keep you afloat no matter what happens, no matter what technologies appear and changes happen out there. Yeah, and in today's environment, you might even be forgiven for having a little bit of worse economic uh, kind of yeah. financial yeah. results. So it actually, in some ways, you could argue this is the time to be investing uh, because you're going to be forgiven if there's a little bit of a, a negative margin hit and oh what God. have you yeah. and be ready to storm the castle as the economy turns around here, hopefully soon. <laughs> Actually, the economy is quite good. I think it's the uh, it's 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 more of a macro environment issue. Well, thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your your perspective. Um, I'm sure that all of the folks out there who are mock curious um, have got a lot of really great takeaways, including car purchases, uh, which is good to know. I'll tell that story later Please over do. drinks. Please yeah. Do. All right. Thank you so much, guys. We'll see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.